We have the amazing Colonel Debs Taylor here this morning, and uh, what a phenom phenomenal woman. Uh, some of the projects that I've had the um, privilege of working with Debs on. Uh, so, Debs, welcome. Thanks very much, Ren. It's good to be here. Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you. And it's always great to see you. So, uh, let's just talk a little bit about the history because I'm not actually sure how you got to know about me, but I remember this uh, call coming through and an email about what was uh, an amazing project that you led on for Sandhurst, which is the Women 100. So uh, I got involved at the project at Sandhurst because I was a, a bit of a loose end uh, with jobs. I'm an army reservist um, and somebody asked me would I like to come and do a project and the project was can we celebrate 100 years of female service in the army. It, it was something close to my heart. Um, I, I was served as a regular for 18 years. Um, I'd moved across into the reserve space at yeah. this point. Um, but actually my mother had also been a member of the Women's Royal Army Corps. So, so it's in my blood slightly. Yeah. And I just thought it was, a, it was something I could have impact on. Um, little did I know the path that it would lead us on. Yeah. Um, but when we started looking about how we could celebrate women's service, yeah. We not only wanted to, it to be about the past, we very much wanted it to be about the future yeah. and where we could impact on diversity. Because at the moment, the army still struggles mm -hmm. with um, appealing to mm -hmm. especially a younger generation of women who don't necessarily see it as a, as a career. Mm -hmm. So um, in the army at the moment, we sit somewhere between 12 and 13% as a, as a regular intake of females into the army. Yeah. We, we suffer because we don't always manage to keep hold of them mm -hmm. for as long as their male counterparts. Um, and, and the fact that we haven't actually managed to impact that and move it forward over the last sort of 10, yeah. 15, 20 years, I think speaks everything about we're not doing enough. Yeah. So the idea was to try and do something that would be enough to, to attract. Yeah. So the projects that you um, led on, well, my first engagement with you was around this uh, event that we wanted to run. We had some themes around it, but talk about the, the, the actual launch one, the W100, the Women. 100. Where did that take place? Remind me now. So and how did it come about? So it, it came about because it had largely been forgotten about yeah. um, and there was a, a last minute push by the army to try and get something in in the year of 100 yeah. years and so being picked up as a project officer we put together in between October and December 2017 three specific projects one was a photo shoot with 300 serving women That's um, right. That, that was the first one. The yeah. second one um, was a dinner night where we had past, present and future. Yeah. So we had everyone from young army cadets mm -hmm. right the way through to Chelsea pensioners and everyone in between um, come to, together to do the real celebratory piece. Yeah. And then the look forward piece was the bit that we, we um, right. and I must admit, this still makes me laugh now because I'd, I'd sat in a room in October thinking, how am I going to do all this? And somebody um, else who's involved in army engagement had said to me, you need Wren, that, that's who you need. She can, she, she's like a fairy godmother. She can wave a wand and make things happen. I was like, okay, well, I'll, I'll just phone her. Who is this person? <laughs> who is this person who is magical? Um, and, you know, and I phoned you and you were just so welcoming. I think I, I blurted out this, can you help down the end of the phone? And I think you invited me up here and we must have spent, yeah. I don't know, maybe an hour, hour and a half talking yeah. about what the possibilities were. Um, and what came out of that meeting for me is that it, it isn't just about an echo chamber in the army. Yeah. We need to be talking much more broadly. Yeah. Um, we need to be talking into environments where this is why diversity is absolutely for, foremost on the agenda. Yes. And, and talking to women who have who have already yeah. done this within their own organisations. Well, some of the uh, forums that we run uh, we ran at that time were pretty amazing. But one that actually stands out massively for me and something I speak about all the time now is the unconscious bias. Yeah. Because I thought that was the the real that that really took hold for a lot of people because there's a lot of unconscious bias that goes on. It's going to continue to do that by virtue of what it says on the tin, unconscious bias. Mm. But actually with the armed forces we were starting to see 
a lot of narratives that maybe have been may have been used in the past because it was very male dominated it still is but we're seeing a lot more women coming through and actually what was so nice to see and that was really you know Debs this is was definitely you were the pioneer of making that happen but there were so many men males so many behind understanding about the unconscious bias how they can be able to adapt a little bit more and there were sometimes when actually women were lagging behind in changing the narrative but we had some of the guys coming in and actually helping and, and, and fast forwarding on on this agenda so, tell me what your thoughts on that is because we've not spoken about that bit no we haven't and i don't know if you remember in the question and answer um effort that we had towards the end of the um, forum that we ran. So this was the forum where we had we had invited a hundred people yeah. from different walks of life and we had everybody from uh, sports people to people involved in religion, right. industry and of course that was where you were key for us because you just you know helped us with some of those invites yeah. for interested parties to come along. Um, we had um, all the female brigadiers in the army come along, um, but we also had, and more importantly, we had a number of the male hierarchy in the army come along as Correct. well. One question from a young man in the audience, I don't know if you remember, he's a young corporal, he takes part in the, um, the army Centre for Army Leadership, and he's a leadership activist, and he raised a really important question that sits around that unconscious bias. Part of our culture in the army is the language that we use, as it is with every organisation. Yeah. You know, and he raised the question over how we how um, language is used to to keep that unconscious bias yeah. going. And so, so one of the issues that he had was over the word manning, and we I'm use manning that, yeah. in the army. You know, yeah. that's a term that we've used for a long term. It's accepted. It, it means that the level of people that we've got against the liability for outputs that we've got, we all understand that. Um, but actually it was a really pertinent question for the topic that we were discussing, especially around unconscious bias, because how do you change that? It's a cultural change, it's behaviour change. Yeah. And you have to go right back to the fundamentals, yeah. language and culture being the fundamentals. Yeah. So, um, and really interestingly, just in the last couple of months, the army have changed that language, yeah. and it's now workforce. Right. So it's not; it's no longer planning around manning. It is planning around the workforce, um, and I think that's a really positive. Step I'm glad forward. you told me because I would have carried on saying manning otherwise, and I have been pulled up for saying manning. Yeah, you know, but, but, but it's, you know, it's but again, it's the term that we use, and it's that is unconscious bias. Yeah. Um, you know, and the other bit that came out of that, that I'm still, you know, the, the, the pride moment yeah. for me, um, when we talk about language and culture and behaviour, um, well, was the book. So yeah. um, the, the other part that came out of that forum for me was talking about how language and culture affects stereotypes yes. and what we can do about that from a really young age. Yes. And of course the army has got some very clear regulations about the people it can engage with because yeah. rightfully as a society we're not, we're not encouraging children to be soldiers but what we do want to do is influence young children to say that anything is possible. Yes. And especially... And, and also having some empathy with people who serve, you know, Absolutely. rather than it being just a case of, okay, this is good as a career choice, it's actually about, you know, how does society work? Somebody is protecting us somewhere to be able to do the civilians, to do the jobs that the civilians do. Yeah. So it's an ecosystem that is so, it's reliant on each other. So I think those books are really important and a shout out for those books are really Absolutely. important as well. And, and, and that piece, and, and this is, I think, what makes the whole proposition of what we did, yeah. from the genesis of Army Women 100 and that forum, which gave us a number of recommendations. Yeah. And, and so the idea over the next couple of years, um, yeah. and the, the output was to act on those recommendations. And we did it with the unconscious bias training, yeah. so we held uh, an event at Sandhurst where we invited both um, internal forces people, um, the wider MAD and external industry exactly. to come along and take part in a day of real thought and development around unconscious bias. We use the behavioural specialists at, at Sandhurst um, to give it that academic twist to it, um, but it was a really interactive yeah. session and I think it got people thinking, yeah. which is what we're after. Yeah. So, yeah. 
that, that ability to make exactly them think. That. So the book that my favourite one, because there's quite a few of them in the uh, in in the series, but my favourite one is My Mummy Is a Soldier. So as everybody knows, I'm also a reservist, which I'm so delighted about being a reservist because it was a long, long, long ambition of mine. So I did scrub out the my mummy and put my grand mummy <laughs> <laughs> in the in the book, but put that to one side. There's something else I'd love for you to talk about, and I don't know if you, you know, this really putting you on the spot here, Debs, is uh, when Danny came on and she spoke about, do you want to just mention who Danny is, and spoke about her little story about Fireman um, Sam. Um, so really, luckily, we had a contact that put us um, in touch with Danny Cotton, London Fire Brigade Commissioner, right. um, a woman who has absolutely reached the top of her tree, in an environment where there isn't a huge amount of diversity yeah. and she has she's absolutely been supported by colleagues but but culturally yeah. it wasn't a place where women thrived yeah. and so she has you know she explained her story about how she has reached the various levels and a lot of that she's done through confrontation yeah the ability to call things out yeah but the story that she told that i think got all of us thinking because it's innocuous yeah uh you know is a story about fireman sam yeah and when she said to us that uh she had received death threats because she'd wanted to change the name of fireman sam yeah. and she'd wanted to change that to firefighter sam yeah and there were people yeah. who were absolutely you know and social media being what it is today she was being trolled on social media she was under a lot of pressure yeah and it became blown out of all proportion yeah for something that we all know is the right thing to do yeah but but for some reason it offends some people's sensibilities yeah and, and it's an opinion as well and, and all of that sort of stuff the interesting bit that made me laugh about that that whole speech and Dania's speech was, she was absolutely really um, totally amazing and she is an amazing woman was when uh she pointed out guys Fireman Sam is not real. Yeah. It's not a real person, you know. <laughs> so, really, yeah. so that was quite good fun. But on some other stuff that you've ma managed to build and do since uh, that first forum, um, the events, those three events that you've spoken about, is something quite phenomenal and really something I'm proud to be able to say that I've had a little teeny uh, bit of uh, engagement on. <laughs> it's, it's, it's all, it was your driving force behind that, Debs. It's um, cultivating uh, some amazing stakeholders around the STEM subject and actually bringing probably, I mean, you've brought so many young people to Sandhurst. You know, you didn't do it once. You went and did it again and again. Talk about that a little bit because I think it's such an important subject and, you know, there's lots of little pockets all over the place that are doing stuff to encourage young people into STEM careers. But actually the Army are doing a fantastic piece of work around this at Sandhurst, you know. So, and I know you'll remember this because I remember us sitting next to each other and various things were coming out at the end of the forum, people making recommendations, and we were busily scribbling them all down. And it was actually Colonel Claire Phillips, who yeah. was the, um, she was the regimental colonel of the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers. Yeah. They have a double whammy with diversity because not only are girls not joining the army, yeah. girls are not joining STEM trades in the army. Yeah. And those absolutely, we, we see that the numbers drop yeah. off less than half in those STEM trade groups. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet we all know that that's tomorrow's business. And if yeah. we don't get people working in that way now, if we don't encourage young yeah. people, that there, there is a whole skill force out there in the future mm -hmm. that we are gonna be missing this yeah. element. And whether it's the army taking them, giving them some apprenticeship training, and then them yeah. going out into wider industry, becoming entrepreneurs, yeah. wh whatever it is, they're all gonna need those skills. Absolutely. So we took that sort of initial prompt from Colonel Claire, yeah. and uh, we said, right, we, we will put an event on at Sandhurst. Mm -hmm. uh, the first year that we did it, uh, we invited 900 school girls along mm -hmm. from, from schools across the country. Mm -hmm. um, because of the resource that it takes for yes. schools to come to an event such as that, yeah. um, we got a lot of independent schools. And mm -hmm. so, so we did face a little bit of criticism because we, we 
have always faced criticism in the army for being slightly elitist in the officer corps. Uh, and therefore, um, to face this criticism yeah. when what we were trying to do was promote diversity, and especially amongst the STEM trades, yeah. was actually it was a bit of a it was a bit of a moment for us. Yeah. You know, having put this hard work into yeah. providing this event, which was um, it was basically a careers fair in mm -hmm. which we we did a very holistic view of what STEM is. Yeah. Uh, we asked about forty industry mm -hmm. partners, um, and we're talking all large industrial. But also right down to small That's in, right, uh, yeah. providers. It's very inclusive. Um, uh, and we asked them to come along and showcase what they did yeah. and talk to the young people. But we're not talking 17, 18, 19 year olds who have already made the decisions about what they're going to do. We were talking about 10, 11, 12 year olds. That's right. And we got them all down to Sandhurst on the day. It was it was open season, you know. Well, I've got to mention this. When you say we got them all uh, down to Sandhurst for the day, can you remind me how many that looked like? So on the first the first turn of the wheel, it was about nine hundred. Exactly. Um, so mean, there's not one or two here. Nine hundred. It was it was immense. It and, was. And immense. what still breaks me slightly is the schools that weren't able to come yeah. because we they couldn't get the transport, and yeah. that that is within the state sector. So what we decided to do for the follow on year yeah. was remedy some of that. Mm -hmm. We wanted to do it bigger and better anyway. And we said, well, if we've got all these companies coming, we've got all the army trade groups coming, let's just do it over two days. Yeah. So, you know, if you're going to make that effort to come here and yeah. show, show, you, show you stuff, um, I, I think we can increase the numbers. I think we can definitively increase the numbers in state school if we give them more notice. Yeah. So we gave ourselves a, a longer run in time. Um, and the second time round, over the two days, we got 2,000 children. We specifically aimed stuff um, towards the state schools. Um, and what we did manage to get was a couple of the industry partners to um, do some corporate responsibility. They sponsored a couple of the state schools to come along. Yeah, there was one particular organisation who uh, put their hand up. But I remember you rang me. I remember sat at my desk here and you said, Ren, I don't know what to do about this, but we've got the school who want to send their children across, but they don't have money for the transport. And then one of your partners came along and said, don't you worry about it, we'll fund that. It was phenomenal. Yeah. And um, so, so Goldman Sachs, yeah. for another one of our events, we had PA Consulting, That's he right. supported it. Um, you know, that. There is a willingness yes. and there is support out there. It's about connecting. Yeah. It's about connecting the dots. And I think when we come back to what it is that yeah. we were able to work out between us yeah. was how to connect the dots. Yeah. Because there's lots of this, as you said, there is lots of willingness to do outreach in STEM. Mm. There are lots of schools who want this type of activity because not only does it tick a box on their curriculum, it's the right thing to do for young children is okay. show them. Because unless you're unless your parents or your wider family are involved in civil engineering or a microbiologist or, or someone who goes out and tests water for all the rights and wrong things, how do you know about these careers? Yeah. And so the idea was if we could bring those kids together, we could show them and yes. you have a go, you know, you yeah. have a go at uh, testing the water or driving the Formula One car or being part of the heavy engineering team that were building a bridge. Have a go and find something that flicks the switch for you. Yeah that can then set you on a path that says, I'm taking maths and physics at school, now I know what I can do with it. Exactly that, because it's about the purpose. You know, we talk about the purpose in so many different ways, but bringing it to a context of what we're talking about here and the projects that you've run and the STEM events, is about, okay, well, I'm learning these subjects but I now know the purpose of learning these subjects could lead me to here, here and here. And sometimes, you know, you've got to feel and see it. So, and to be able to do that in an environment like Sandhurst was just absolutely awesome. I've got to tell you about one of the things that really resonated for me. And, um, and I was at, in the auditorium at that point and we were all sat down, we were listening to some keynote speeches. And it was the time when we had not just girls in, but we had uh, girls and boys in. Yep. Yep. And we had this uh, uh, coach full of young kids. They arrived slightly late because they'd got stuck in traffic and all of that sort of stuff. And they were from a hard to reach uh, school, actually. 
they all made the effort they just looked impeccable mm -hmm. and you could feel you could sense it you know with i mean i can talk about it i i came from a, a you know a, a background where it was quite complex mm -hmm. myself it's for a young person to walk into one of the best institutions in the world and it's everybody is on best behavior you know brace up and all of that sort of good stuff they made such an impression and you could see physically see they were walking out just that little bit taller and for me you can't just manufacture that you know that is like the real cherry on the cake so we've and we've spoken about this before this wasn't about recruiting for the army because everybody says oh well you're just after more numbers for the army it is so much broader than that you know my job as i saw it at sandhurst was about engagement yeah. and about trying to keep the army in the public eye so people are conscious of it yeah. so that the gatekeepers whether they be careers teachers or they be parents or grandparents or godparents or faith leaders or youth leaders that they understand that it is still part and it is available for everyone. Yeah. So I went through Sandhurst um, in 1996. <laughs> um, and, and at the time, I came from state school. Yeah. And, and I was a little bit unusual yeah. at the time. That, that has changed. Yeah. But still, the message is, is still out there yeah. in the independent sector. It's not out there in the state sector. Yeah. This is it's available for everyone. And we need to get people in there yeah. for them to see that and for them to know that it is a national institution. So you've been living this now for quite a while because if I remember correctly, the first uh, Women 100 event was in December 2017. That's right. Yeah. right, okay. So, and you've been living this since and working so hard on it and it's not some, sometimes it's not even part of your day job. You're still doing stuff that is, you know, I've seen you out of hours, emails, like let's connect such and such together. What would, outside of the uh, day job that you were doing with Sandhurst, what do you think that others could do that would help, not necessarily the armed forces here, but even in just society? Is there any dots that are quite easy that, that sh should be linked together? So for me, it's about advocacy. And we spoke about this at the forum as well. It's about peer advocacy and it's about wider advocacy. Yeah. It's about being that person that has positive effect and where you can see connections yeah. and Dame Julia who came to the, exactly. the book, yeah. book launch for us you know her her strap line is connect the unconnected and that really resonates with me exactly. I think if you can have a role in bringing two people together where you're creating a relationship that will have positive effect you're just a force multiplier yeah and, and that should we should we should do that yeah. we, and that's not that's not work yeah that that's just business yeah. and i think you know that bit about what the army teaches you yeah because we're we're sometimes not we're not well supported with resource because we're a public institution and we're supported by public money mm -hmm. sometimes we have to be resourceful as individuals yeah and it's about that resourcefulness of Knowing, knowing how to make those links, mm -hmm. bridging the gaps, bringing people together, making a team work, mm -hmm. and providing the genesis to move yeah. things forward. So, Debs, you are quite unusual, okay, because you have drive, you have this real inbuilt uh, ability to really see the best in people and want the best in people, and you're very generous. And that is something that, and I'd say, when I say generous, in lots of different ways but in this particular construct and what we're talking about here is about the connecting and you're right when Jane Julia spoke about connect the unconnected that's about generosity but in that generosity to be able to say do you know what let me introduce you to x y and z and if things happen that's amazing yeah. because we all get a little bit more fulfilled and I think that's a really key message you know two two things here one is connect the unconnected, so thank you for reminding me on that. And let's just be generous about who we know because that might help somebody else and that ecosystem. So I think that's amazing. So thank you for reminding me on that. But you know, you've been my mentor in that. If I can just say, say thank you. That, that, the fact that you picked up the phone and said yes, yeah. that this brings us full circle right the way back to the start of the conversation because you picked up the phone and said, yes, I'll help. Yeah. And you didn't have to, yeah. but it was, you, it was 
passion. I don't think about it anymore. It just starts to happen. So thank you for that as well. Now, I want to just pull, pull up a couple of points. First of all, uh, one I wanted to really mention is that you've uh, you've been an award winner as well. So you won an award for at Women in Defence. Tell me a little bit about that. So, uh, so because of the STEM event, and I think because it, it achieved a certain amount of notoriety, a lot of the um, industry partners that supported us yeah. were in the defence sector. Um, and I was nominated for an award. I, still, I must admit, I still don't know who by, and you don't, you don't get to find out. So, um, but it was for the promotion of STEM yeah. within defence because it's yeah. a problem for whether you're in defence yeah. sector industry, mm -hmm. whether you're part of our scientific public bodies or whether you're part of the MOD, yeah. we all need those trades. And so there is a specific award about the promotion of STEM. Well, first of all, totally well deserved. And the second part of that is that now that you've got that award, you're going to continue to uh, champion and uh, even help so even the peer-to-peer -peer side so that other people will actually recognise and I think it's so important where somebody like yourself have been given that opportunity that it's still cascading so thank you for doing that because you you do it so well now you also got uh, promoted very recently to uh, commanding officer to 151 regiment how's that going so uh, it's, a, it's a change, it's a very different job than, than the work I was doing at Sandhurst um, and, and I must admit there's a little bit um, uh, about moving on from one job and into another. Some of it is about letting go yeah. and you have to understand where you've set the conditions for success hopefully for the, yeah. for the team that you've left and for the person coming in behind you um, to be able to sort of cut some of those ties. Yeah. Um, I hope I'll still have a role in it because I'd like to have a role in it. Um, but but also I'm now responsible for for one of the army's reserve regiments in London, which is very exciting but very busy. And um, just trying to sort of get my feet into you know understanding exactly what I'm doing and how I'm doing it in yeah. that role. Well, I know why you you you'd be the absolute perfect candidate for it because you know you give. A, if you want a job done you give it to a busy person so you know that doesn't surprise me that you're very busy but you'll be you, um, you are absolutely amazing so i know that this will be something that is i'm proud of the fact that you're doing this which i think is absolutely great so i'm going to ask you a personal question now mm -hmm. and uh w what about you what about deb's taylor colonel deb's taylor so taking the colonel off for a moment what about deb's taylor so uh you know life remains busy and uh if I can indulge for two seconds, I loved my regular army career and yeah. it was 18 years of my life that I wouldn't, I wouldn't go back and change a moment of it. I absolutely yeah, loved it. Um, but you know, there came a point in my own life um, where I'd had three children. I'd had those very successfully in the army and we'd managed to make everything work. And then there was the, the typical squeeze that comes along, which yeah. was an older generation and actually trying to make those two bits work were really difficult yeah. um, and I decided at that point that I would leave the regulars and become a reserve and I have to say the opportunities that are available now and the way that the army is understanding what yeah. can be bought by uh, by retaining skill sets through flexibility yeah. and part-time working wasn't available when I was still in the regulars yeah I think I am part of a new breed of reserve officers who are managing to provide skill set back to the army yeah. through part-time and spare time work. And so the army is retaining some of that skills that they, they yeah. fought really hard to give people yeah. those skills. And actually, instead of just saying now goodbye to them at the end, there are loads more opportunities yeah. for reserves to do stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and for me, it's now become you know my second career. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm now expanding into an area that I didn't think would be possible when I left the regulars. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm really grateful that the army are much more on the front foot yeah. about how their reserves can be employed. Yeah. And there is lots of the sort of portfolio type working. Yeah. And, and that yeah. to me, yeah. the reason that I left the regulars, mm -hmm. there is still an element of that in my life. And so, uh, so my, my work is three days a week commanding yeah. a regiment in, in okay. the British Army. And for me, that is the pinnacle of where I wanted right. to be. So, well, first of all, congratulations Thank in sticking you. with it, because I think there's a lot of um, 
individuals who will feel that way, both male and female, but I think it makes a big a sea change for females and the armed forces. But I did ask you, and I said, I'm just going to be funny <laughs> now, I did say, so taking the colonel hat off, so personally, what does that mean? And do you know what? Debs, you're just army, 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 <laughs> which is great. So that's, you know, I just wanted to point it out. There's no yeah. separating no, no really separating. from Green Corps. <laughs> no, absolutely. So um, one final question, and this is possibly going to put you on the spot, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because that's the one thing I love asking. If we had a magic wand and we were able to say, ding, what would that look like? What would that request be? For me, personally, yeah. Yeah. and for what we've done, yeah. I think it's about driving, it's about networking, and wherever possible, it's about bringing together the powerful networks that can have influence, yeah. building on the advocacy that we've already got, and, and being able to, yeah. to sprinkle some of that generosity of spirit, yeah. whatever that, that looks like. And to some people, it's, it's just an unknown thing. Yeah. Some people have a natural ability to do it, other people need prompting. Perhaps it would be about getting those people who aren't good at it to just get in there and get stuck in. So there's there's a couple of things I want to say on that. So one of them is, okay, the big beast that was created in terms of W100 and then the different forums and the stems and all of that sort of stuff where, you know, there's going to be some continuation of that and that's great. So there's people that have, you've, you've started to coach and get them in, in space to... to, to continue that advocacy but there's also what what if we just did a big event once a year to just promote and teach around the networking and actually bring to get together people who will be mini you's or mini me's or what, let's just think about it yeah because let's not lose it yeah i think t to me there is still so much to be done yeah. and and actually the next piece of work that I'm doing as a byline to yeah. and, and it's a follow-on piece of work from Sandhurst but it's about connecting networks and it's yeah. about the networks that I've come across how we bring some of those together right. to produce some influence and so if there is something to come out of it you know yeah. the legacy because yeah. I think if you're going to do something then yeah. try and leave a, a so, legacy uh, absolutely so here goes the request then so if anybody is listening do you need resource to help with that what what is it no, I think what we do need, if there are networks out there that want to be included, yeah, let let's hear from right. them. <laughs> That's great. That, that's the call, I guess. Yeah, and it is just about a call to action. Yeah, be, be involved because you want to be involved, not just yeah. because it's the right thing to do. Feel it. Yeah. Well, uh, do you know what that whole from my hilltop, and it's always I love speaking to Debs because you inspire me. I love talking to you. But this whole piece about helping people, whichever walk of life they come from, just shines through. And thank you so much, Debs. Not a problem. <laughs>